the heaven and the earth. Title of the message this morning is The Beast Shall Teach Thee. The Beast Shall Teach Thee. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. We pray that you would bless and guide now. I pray that you'd speak to hearts and work in lives. I pray for those here this morning that have never been born again the Bible way, that you'd draw them to yourself. May you be glorified in and through this service. In Jesus' name, amen. The beast shall teach thee. And this is the seventh message in a series on the evidences in nature for a creator God. We started by looking at birds and the overwhelming evidence for a designer and creator that they show. And then we looked at insects and the almost unbelievable detail and intricacy of design that is manifest in the insect world. Lastly, we looked at outer space and the incredible magnitude and design that is there. I believe it was Abraham Lincoln that said he did not understand how any man could look into outer space and still be an atheist. Today we know a thousand times more about outer space as they knew in Lincoln's day. All of it fi fascinating. This morning we want to concern ourselves primarily with mammals in particular, animals in general. There's incredible diversity and creativity throughout the entire animal kingdom, giving evidence to a creator God. The evolutionist claims that this world is a product of evolution. And the Bible claims that this world was created by God. Two great, bold, and antithetical statements, one of which at least must be wrong. In the attempt at compromise through the proposal of theistic evolution is a vain endeavor to, to accommodate the skeptic at the expense of a literal interpretation of the Word of God. Did animals evolve? It's an important question. Because if they did... You and I are wasting our time this morning. We might as well go home, forget church, and throw our Bibles away. For if God didn't create this world, the Bible is a lie. Consider with me this morning some of the wonders of creation. There was such remarkable variety and complexity and ingenuity in the animal kingdom. And unfortunately, we really only have time for a few examples. There are literally thousands of examples that we could look at, all of them unique, all of them perfectly equipped for their environment, all of them bearing testimony to a designer and creator. Consider the camel, wonderfully suited for the rigors of the desert. Did he evolve into such a creature? If so, how? Surely a creature not already suited for such a habitat would not willingly stay there and wait to evolve into the animal that it is now. Why did it not leave for greener pastures? And if there was something that kept it from leaving, why only it? How did other creatures get out? Or why did they not adapt in their own way at whatever stage they were at in the evolutionary process? Remember the evolutionist says that Evolution is unplanned and unguided, so the camel would have had to accidentally evolve into a creature that is wonderfully suited for the desert. Actually, the camel was designed for the desert. He has wide hooves that keep him from sinking into the deep sand. Each foot has two toes, long toes with a tough piece of leathery skin like webbing stretched between them. His Web feet are spongy, and they spread out and become wider the more weight is put on them. Without these specially designed feet, the camel would not be able to make much progress across the desert at all. It would be a slow and tiring trip if he didn't have his special sand shoes. A fully loaded camel can weigh as much as 1,600 pounds. Without his webbed feet, he'd sink into the sand with each step he took. It would be very difficult to make any progress at all. Because of his feet and the other features that God has given him, a camel can carry a 400-pound load 100 miles across hot desert sand in one day. The animal is required to kneel while heavy loads are placed on its back, in some cases 800 pounds or more. Its knees are furnished with thick calloused pads to protect them. and These are not developed by pressure and use. Baby camels are born with them. 
Sandstorms are common in the desert. The wind whips up grains of sand with such force that it can completely strip all the paint off a car in a short amount of time. And should you happen to park in the middle of the Sahara, the camel was given extra long eyelashes to shield his eyes from the blowing sand. They act like a screen. They, the camel can see out, but the sand can't get in. His ears have long hairs that keep the sound out, but let keep the sand out, but let the sound in, excuse me. He has special muscles in his nostrils that enable him to partially close them in such a way to be able to keep out the sand but still be able to breathe. The Bactrian camel has two humps. The Arabian camel has one hump. Most people think that the camel stores water in its hump. It is a storage tank, but not for water. The camel's hump contains about 100 pounds of fat. It is an emergency food supply. If the camel can't find plants to eat, the fat in the hump supplies him with the energy that he needs. So if a camel can't store water or doesn't store water in his hump, where does he keep it? A thirsty camel has been known to drink 27 gallons of water in 10 minutes. And then he can go eight days before he has a drink again. The water is not stored in his stomach. Only digestive juices are kept there. Actually, there is no storage tank for water in the camel's body. Where does that 27 gallons go? And 10 minutes after his big drink, the water has disappeared. It has already traveled to every cell in his body. The water is divided up equally among his body tissues. The millions of tiny blood vessels called capillaries in the camel's stomach and intestine. When the water reaches those two areas, it passes through tiny openings in the capillaries and enters the bloodstream. This process is called osmosis. The water enters the bloodstream and mixes with the blood. It quickly flows to every part of the camel's body. The bloodstream carries the water to each body cell. The water bathes each cell and the space between each cell. And all of this happens in less than 10 minutes. Scientists tested a 1,000-pound camel that was given no water for eight days. Each day during the test, the temperature was at least 125 degrees. At the end of eight days, the camel had lost 227 pounds. Take that, Jenny Craig, 227 pounds in eight days. One-fourth of his body weight in water. Scientists also tested his blood. Normally, a camel's blood contains 94% water, just like a human's blood. But at the end of eight days, the camel had lost 10% of the water in his blood. And still, his blood flowed smoothly. Doctors tell us when we lose 5% of the water in our blood, we can no longer see. When we lose 10%, we cannot hear and we go insane. If we lose 12%, then we die. The reason is because the blood thickens like molasses. The heart has to struggle to pump it, and it cannot enter some of the more minute uh, vessels and capillaries that it needs to. A camel's blood becomes thick only when it loses 40% of the water through perspiration, dehydration. Scientists gave their camel water on the ninth day, and it drank back all 227 pounds it lost in 10 minutes. And then they tested its blood right at 94% again. The camel only travels at 8 to 10 miles per hour, but it can keep up this pace for 20 hours without stopping. This animal has been re remarkably designed by a creator God for the work God planned for it to do. Proverbs 3.19, the Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. Jeremiah 51.15, he hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heaven by his understanding. Consider the lowly mole, not the ones on your arm, but the little creature that looks somewhat like a mouse. As small as he is, he has been perfectly designed to do what he needs to do. He doesn't have toes on his feet, just paws with claws, five long, sharp claws on each paw. He can't run very well, but he can sure dig. Every part of the mole's body is designed so that he can dig quickly and efficiently. The mole can hear grubs and worms as they crawl and eat their way through the ground. He has a built-in sensor system uh, that is like a seismograph. The mole has a seismograph on his tail and on his nose. Tiny hairs on his tail can pick up the vibrations of a grub several feet away. And these vibrations send a signal to his brain and alert his body to, for instance, maybe back up three feet in the tunnel that he's dug and, and dig seven inches to the left. The mole has a better sense of touch and 
and uh, sensitivity to vibration than any other mammal on earth. It's been said that the mole's nose is the most sensitive and accurate vibration detector known to science today. It has thousands of tiny parts, each one attached to his brain that tells him where the grub is that's making the chewing noise. On the end of the mole's nose are thousands of tiny bumps called imer organs. Each bump has one sensitive hair in it that picks up the vibrations from an insect moving through the soil a few feet away. The hairs vibrate, causing the imer organs to send electrical signals to the, brains, uh, the brain of the mole at telling him exactly where to tunnel through the earth to get to the insect. Now the mole eats often, day and night. He will uh, work and eat for about four or five hours, and then he'll rest for three or four hours. Over a period of one year, this little half-pound bundle of dark gray velvet can eat 60 pounds of grubs and worms and other insects. He needs to eat constantly to stay alive. If his nose was not so sensitive... He would starve to death. Now, if he is the product of evolution, he developed that sensitivity over tens of or hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And how did he survive when he had only 10 little bumps on his nose that didn't work very well instead of thousands that worked perfectly? The theory of evolution contradicts logic. It contradicts the Bible. It contradicts science, and it contradicts common sense. It is based upon untenable assumptions and wild guesses. The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin, a book that would have to be considered the evolutionist original Bible. The phrase, let us assume. And the phrase, we may well suppose. Those phrases appear over 800 times in that book. Add to that a number of times where the phrases may have been or may be appear. They can't be sure of anything, and, and even when they think they're sure of something, oftentimes they're wrong. But it's amazing how many people will blindly follow them because they have some degrees from some quote-unquote prestigious university behind their name. And because they've studied for years, it's assumed that they know what they're talking about. Some of the men held up to be the most brilliant men of our day. God calls fools. And there are men who may be intellectually gifted in one area or another, but that doesn't make them authorities in every area of their life. And look at Einstein, brilliant man, but he, he didn't even know how to comb his hair. He didn't know how to drive. And he married his first cousin, as did Darwin, by the way. But there are people, millions of them, who will accept what Einstein or Darwin or Carl Sagan says as gospel truth, and, and they'll reject the Bible in spite of the fact that there is no evidence, no evidence for the theory of evolution. Hey, if you believe in evolution, you ought to put it to work in your own life. Let your garden evolve. You can even give it a head start, plant some vegetables or flowers in a plot of ground, and then just sit back and let it evolve. And go back in two or three months. Has it evolved or has it devolved? It's devolved. You'll have weeds. Your plants will not be doing real well. Something worse will have happened, not something better. Let anything in your life evolve. Let your car evolve into something better. It just left to itself and the random forces of nature. Don't even change the oil. Let your child evolve. The Bible tells us a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Let your house evolve. Ladies, don't do anything to your home. Forget housework. And let your house evolve into something wonderful. Uh, put away your watch. Uh, uh, let, put it away for a while and see if it won't evolve into a grandfather clock. Uh, nothing in life evolves. And yet we're expected to believe that all of life has evolved. Mutations are almost always negative and rarely self-propagating. And yet we're expected to believe that our entire world has gotten better, more advanced, stronger, more efficient, more intelligent through this very means. The whole theory of evolution stands in contrast to the second law of thermodynamics that everything is wearing out and breaking down and becoming more random, and yet the second law of thermodynamics is a scientifically accurate, provable, testable, established fact. No scientist disputes it. So which are you going to go with? A theory which has no scientific basis whatsoever or an undeniable, firmly established 
scientific fact. It's not blind faith you exercise when you believe the Bible. It's blind faith that you exercise when you believe evolution, for there is no evidence whatsoever for the theory. There are many animals that have been given remarkable survival instincts and abilities, techniques. If they had had to learn them over a period of hundreds or thousands or millions of years, they could not have survived. Who taught the possum to fake death, if not God, its creator? When captured, it can immediately simulate death. Its jaw hangs open, it lays on its back or its side, its tongue extended and its eyes dimmed. Even if kicked or beaten, it it will not quiver a muscle or, or flicker an eyelid. And when its attacker loses interest and wanders away, the possum scampers to safety. This is a God-given instinct. It's not learned behavior. The little possum baby has it when it's born. Consider the kangaroo. Full grown, it's strong and capable in full flight. It can clear nine-foot fences easily. And sometimes he can't do as much as he thinks he can do. Oh, I know, I know, but... If cornered, it can rest on its tail alone and strike out with both powerful hind feet at the same time. When standing upright, it is almost as tall as a man. It can hop along at speeds of up to 40 miles per hour. But when it is first born, it is only an inch long, soft, bare, blind, and helpless. It's semi-transparent like an earthworm. It only weighs about one-thirty-fifth of an ounce been given an instinct upon birth to make its way immediately to its mother's crouch or pouch, crawling on its knees and elbows. It makes its way up one of its mother's kangaroo's legs uh, to her abdomen, struggling along until it finds her pouch. And once inside, it attaches itself to its mother and, and begins to nurse. There's a circular muscle that surrounds the lips of the baby kangaroo, which contracts in a tight, involuntary uh, spasm, which keeps the little Joey firmly attached to his mother, uh, even when she's hopping around at 40 miles an hour, and even when she's clearing nine-foot fences, little Joey stays attached. The Joey will nurse for around 14 months. The older the little Joey gets, the more it needs a fat, rich milk, while the younger Joey needs more carbohydrates. Oftentimes, the mother will have two different age Joeys, little Joeys, in her pouch at the same time. A younger one and an older one. How can she meet the needs of both at the same time? God designed the mother kangaroo to produce two different types of milk at the same time for the needs of both Joeys. The windpipe in other mammals and in humans terminates at the same level as the esophagus. If it was this way in the baby kangaroo, it would choke to death. It could not survive. Instead, its its windpipe is elongated and shunted forward into the back opening of the nasal chamber. Thus, no milk can go the wrong way, and air gets right down to the lung. At what point did that special windpipe evolve, and how did any kangaroo survive before it did? You know, the kangaroo was designed by God. First, Samuel 4, or First Kings 4, 29, and God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite and Heman and Chalcol and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even under the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. It would be interesting to know how much Solomon knew. There are so many things about the animal world that we are just now finding out and many, many things that we will never know in this world. Each new discovery, each new interesting fact points to a creator, a designer, a mastermind behind it all. And still the evolutionist wants you to believe that it all just fell into place. Consider the beaver. When he fells a tree by the river, he can usually drop it right where he needs to put it. He doesn't have to practice an experiment either from his first tree to his last one. He is remarkably accurate. The dams that they build oftentimes are more than 500 feet long, almost two football fields in length. 
If the stream is rapid and deep, the beaver will build, they'll build their dam with a convexity facing upstream, showing a wonderful innate knowledge of engineering. They're hydrological engineers of the first rank. If the river is wide and turbulent, they will build a series of dams, thereby creating less pressure or less strain on any given dam. All beaver dams are constructed at an angle of 45 degrees, the same angle that is used by all hydroelectric dams throughout the world today. This angle has been determined to be the most effective and the strongest to hold back the massive water pressure on a dam. But how did beavers know to build it like this? Engineers came to that conclusion after a lot of testing and trial and error, but the beaver just does it automatically. They chop trees into five or six foot lengths and take smaller branches and sticks along with the roots, grasses, and moss, and mud, and clay, and construct a perfectly watertight home. Within their dome-shaped house is a central chamber with its floor a little above the level of the water and two shafts which have their outer openings beneath the water. One of these shafts is a straight one with a moderate incline. It is up this shaft that the beavers drag their logs and bark that they need to maintain their home and for their winter food supply. The other shaft is more abrupt in its descent and winding in its course. It's their normal entrance and exit. On the floor of their ledge is a snug carpet of bark and wood chips and long wood fibers. The beaver has a heavy, ta- a heavy body and short fat legs with webbed hind feet and a flat paddle shaped tail. He's best suited to life in the water. It does not travel well on land. They must travel in the water to be safe, especially when they have to carry something like bark or logs on land. He's very awkward then. So what do beavers do when they've used up all the good trees that grow close to the river? They build canals. They may make a shortcut between one bend of a winding stream and another. They may cut right through an island. They may completely change the course of a river. And some of their canals are several hundred feet in length. And then they use the canals to transport the logs to where they need them. Engineers who build dams say that the beaver's dam is built the best way known to man. They are built the same way that engineers would build them if those were all the supplies that they could use. But engineers have to be taught how to build dams. They have to learn. They have to study. Who taught the beaver? His mother? No. A beaver is born knowing how to build a dam and how to build a canal. If you take a beaver as soon as it's born and you raise him in a laboratory until it's grown, no other beavers around, and then you turn him loose by a stream, he would build a perfect dam with his very first attempt. If that innate knowledge that he has at birth is part of the evolutionary process as well, then how come we don't have that ability? Since we're a quote-unquote higher, more advanced life form. If your dad is an architect, you should be born knowing how to be an architect. Even if raised by adoptive parents in a different environment. If your parents were mathematical geniuses, then you should be a mathematical genius without having to study or be educated. Beavers build a dam. They construct special channels that allow excess water to pass through, maintaining the required water level and still allow the stream to continue past the dam. Beaver has a gland on his stomach that produces oil. He takes that oil and he rubs it in his hair and he gets his hair all oily. Why? It waterproofs him. It insulates him from the cold. It reduces friction, thus making him quicker and more maneuverable in the water. How does he know to do that? And who taught him? How did that evolve? How did he evolve that gland? And of what use would it have been until it fully evolved? No, he was born knowing how, and he was born with that gland. The beaver evolved, if it did in the, in the millions of years, it must have taken him to develop to where he could gnaw down a tree. Have you ever tried to chew a tree down? And then to how to build a dam. How did he escape his predators in the meantime and even survive? Beavers help prevent soil erosion. They create marshlands. They construct this complicated system of dams and canals that help prevent flooding. The beaver has a set of four front teeth that will grow throughout his entire life. His back teeth will remain a constant size and not continue to grow. The front teeth will conti- are continually worn down through the beaver's gnawing, his constant chewing on food, and so remain an optimum size for the beaver. The two special flaps of skin behind the front teeth that keep wood, chip- wood chips from accidentally entering the beaver's mouth when he's cutting down a tree. 
A lot of unique things about the beaver recorded in the book Character Sketches. It said the beaver has an unconventional way of taking a bath to rid itself of irritating fleas and parasites. It ambles about looking for a particular mound of earth. Once it finds the mound, it flops on top of it, begins to shuffle in a sprawled position. Soon ants are crawling all over its thick fur. But rather than being irritated by these creatures, the beaver seems to enjoy their attention. To a naive bystander, the procedure would be totally incomprehensible, but the beaver's actions make perfect sense to him. The ants are having a holiday as they scurry through the fur of the beaver, ferreting out and eating annoying parasites. Both parties benefit. Also, beavers warn each other of danger by bringing their tails up over their backs and then slamming them down on the water with great force. Any beaver hearing the sound of this crack, which may travel for over half a mile on a clear night, quickly dives beneath the surface and remains there for as long as it possibly can. The beaver is equipped with large lungs and an oversized liver. As it dives, its heartbeat slows and it requires less less oxygen. And blood vessels which supply the extremities constrict so the oxygen supply to the brain area is not affected at all. By drawing on the reserve in its tissues and lungs, it relaxes its muscles and slows its heartbeat sinking to the bottom of the pond. After hearing an alarm, the beaver can remain underwater for as long as 17 minutes before it needs to surface again for air. If the pond freezes over, the beaver lowers the water level of the pond by deliberately making holes in the dam, which allow the water to flow out. And this creates a a gap between the water level and the ice, providing sufficient air and space for the beaver to breathe and swim on the water, even though the surface is solidly frozen. An average beaver requires 22 to 30 ounces of bark each day. Beavers fell between two and three hundred trees a year. In late autumn, uh, the beaver begins storing its food for the winter, busily retrieves branches and anchors them by ramming them into the bottom of the pond. This maze of sticks and twigs becomes a storehouse of food. And when the ice freezes over in winter conditions, the beaver swims to his storehouse and chews off a hunk and returns to his lodge to eat the bark with kind of a revolving corn on the cob type technique. If a sudden storm or melting snow causes the water level on the pond to rise dangerously, the the beaver gnaws soil from the ceiling of his chamber and replaces it along the lower level of the den, causing his bedroom to rise up a little bit, building up the floor. If If the ceiling construction begins to suffer and becomes too thin, then additional twigs and soil are placed on top. God designed the beaver to know exactly how to survive in its environment. Consider the bat... He has a remarkable radar system. If he's deprived of his eyesight, which is poor anyway, he can still fly around and over and under all kinds of obstacles without ever crashing. There are several hundred species of bat alone. There's a cave in Texas from which every night a rapidly moving swarm of bats emerges, a little literal cloud of bats which takes over two hours for all the bats to get out. Grant Jeffrey writes, it is hard for the evolutionist to explain how the bat with an extremely sophisticated and complex sonar echolocation system that emits ultra-high frequency sound waves, ultrasound, at more than 20,000 cycles per second, could possibly have evolved. The high frequency of those ultrasounds makes them undetectable by humans who have a more limited sound range. However, the sound waves hit and reflect from any surrounding objects, the ground, trees, humans, walls, bats, and the insects they hunt. He says, remarkably, the bat's brain is able to form a three-dimensional matrix of its environment based on the reflected sound waves to precisely determine the distance and direction of the surrounding objects. The detailed information facilitates the incredible accuracy of the bat's flight and capture of insects in the dark. Peter Forbes writes in the book, The Gecko's Foot, only too often physicists, engineers, or chemists invent something it says, biologists then discover that nature has already invented it. It wasn't nature, by the way. It was God, but he's going to give credit to, quote, unquote, nature. And then he says, often hundreds of millions of years before, which we know also is not true, but thousands of years before, God created these uh, things that now uh, engineers are inventing. It says, the phenomenon itself is not known until discovered by the technologists. Obvious examples are echolocation in bats and sonar in whales and dolphins. Before ultrasound was invented, scientists could have dissected bats for eternity and still not understood their echolocation mechanism. Just a man with all of his knowledge, all of his study, 
puts his brain power to work, and, and after many, many years of study, invents something, only to find out that God had created it thousands of years before. The bat's radar system is highly specialized with pinpoint accuracy. No half bat has ever been discovered anywhere in the world, alive or in the fossil record. It would be hard to even imagine uh, how such a creature could possibly survive with half wings or with half a radar system. The bat's entire being is an example of irreducible complexity as testimony against evolution. The book, The Evolution Cruncher, cites the six-inch Crassonyxeris thondolondal bat, his name is longer than he is, which weighs only six one-hundredths of an ounce. Six one-hundredths of an ounce. The book says it has all the multiplied thousands of specialized organs that every mammal has. How can this be? A tiny little creature with a radar system, complex beyond anything we can create, weighs six one-hundredths of an ounce. How did that evolve? The evolutionist doesn't know because it didn't evolve. God made the bat and he equipped him to be able to fly in dark caves and on the darkest nights. God equipped every creature with exactly what it needed. He designed even the little woodchuck and made him where he would hibernate when, wood would, when food would be scarce. During that time, he must be able to conserve a fat and, and food and energy. So his whole body system slows way down. Normally, he breathes 38 to 40 times a minute and even much faster when he's excited When he's hibernating, he breathes 10 or 12 times an hour. For every 200 breaths he took before, while he is hibernating, he only takes one breath. Try that sometime. To conserve energy, just cut your breathing down to one two hundredth of what you normally do. How did that evolve? We don't have time this morning to consider the elephant and the wolverine and the skunk and the lion and the hippopotamus and on and on and on. But there is no doubt that evolution never happened. It is a lie. A lie made up by men who didn't want there to be a God. A lie first formed in the depths of hell. John 8, 44, Jesus said to a group of people, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. God created the world, and he created you. And just like he knew how to design every creature perfectly, he knew how to make you. A giraffe neck on an elephant wouldn't have worked. The head weighs so much the neck couldn't support it. The radar capabilities of the bat weren't needed on the rhinoceros. He knew how to design each animal. He had a specific purpose. And he knew how to make you. He had a specific purpose. And if you're empty this morning and your life seems without purpose, there's a reason. Isaiah 57, verse 20, the wicked, and the wicked is anybody that's never accepted Christ's payment for their sins, and they've gone on in their life being a lawbreaker, breaking God's commandments. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Oh, the answer this morning is you need to get saved. Jesus Christ died to save you from your sin. He wants you to have an abundant life. He said, the thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life. And that they might have it more abundantly. We mentioned the giraffe. How about the giraffe? What a marvelous animal. The evolutionist wants you to believe that the giraffe just evolved. The giraffe is the tallest of all land animals growing to around 18 feet high. Its heart can be more than two feet long. And it's specifically engineered for the particular needs that it has. It has an entire network of bypasses and anti-pooling valves to enable it to raise and lower its 500-pound neck and head without fainting. NASA scientists have, have spent a great amount of time studying the giraffe's neck and its heart and its internal organs to help them design and develop gravity suits for space travel. The neck of the giraffe has been an object of marvel to those involved with design study. Dean Kenyon writes, the giraffe is equipped with a coordinated system of blood pressure control. Pressure sensors along the neck's arteries monitor the blood pressure and can signal activation of other mechanisms to counter any increase in pressure as the giraffe drinks or grazes when it lowers its head. Contraction of the artery walls, a shunting of part of the arterial blood flow to bypass the brain, and a web of small blood vessels called the marvelous net between the arteries and the brain, all serve to control the blood pressure in the giraffe's head. 
Surprisingly, a giraffe has only seven vertebrae in its neck, as do all other mammals. The giraffe's neck is, was designed so he could feed from the high branches of trees. The color markings or the spots on that long neck and on the giraffe's body are unique. No two are the same. Similarly, the stripes on a zebra's body are completely unique, as are the markings on a lot of other animals. God is a God of great variety. Favorite meal of the giraffe is the acacia tree. Uh, males feed on the higher branches. Females feed on the lower ones. They have a tongue that extends their reach another two feet or so. Giraffes are social animals that travel in herds as large as 40. They have not only a good vantage point from the top of that long neck, but they have excellent eyesight as well. They have few natural enemies. The lions sometimes will attack a baby giraffe and even occasionally a full-grown one. The latter of choice, a full-grown giraffe, can be a poor choice as a full-grown giraffe can weigh 4,200 pounds. And they say their kick is powerful enough to literally tear a lion's head off sometimes. Gestation period for a giraffe is 15 months. A little junior at birth, at birth, will stand about six feet tall and weigh about 150 pounds. Within an hour of being born, he can walk and even run short distances. Now, the obvious and sensible answer for how the giraffe got its long neck is that God made it that way. But that answer is not allowed, according to Richard Dickerson. Richard Dickerson is a prominent biochemist and elected member of the elite National Academy of Sciences who specializes in X-ray crystallographic studies of proteins and DNA. He writes, science fundamentally is a game. It is a game with one overriding and defining rule. Rule number one, let us see how far and to what extent we can explain the behavior of the physical and material universe in terms of purely physical and material causes without invoking the supernatural. In other words, let's explain everything, but we can't bring God into it. Operational science takes no position about the existence or non-existence of the supernatural. It only requires that this factor is not to be invoked in scientific explanations. Calling down special purpose miracles as explanations constitutes a form of intellectual cheating. So if you try to bring God into the explanation, well, you're cheating. A chess player is perfectly capable of removing his opponent's king physically from the board and smashing it in the midst of a tournament, but this would not make him a chess champion because the rules had not been followed. A runner may be tempted to take a shortcut across the infield of an oval track in order to finish the, cross the finish line ahead of his faster colleague, but he refrains from doing so as this would not constitute winning under the rules of the sport. So you understand, they're saying, well, you can explain this universe any way you want as long as that explanation doesn't involve God. We don't allow God, that's cheating. So obviously we'll have to come up with a different answer as to the reason for the giraffe's long neck. Well, fortunately, evolution has the answer. If you went to public school, you already know what it is. Jean de Monet writes, We know that this animal, the tallest of mammals, dwells in the interior of Africa in places with a soil almost always arid and without herbage. That's not true, by the way. Obliges it to browse on trees and to strain itself continuously to reach them. That's also not true, by the way. This habit sustained for long has had the result in all members of its race that the forelegs have grown longer than the hind legs and that its neck has become so stretched that the giraffe without standing on its hind legs lifts its head to a height of six meters. Charles Darwin wrote, So under nature with the nascent giraffe, or the beginning, the origin of the giraffe, the individuals which were the highest browsers and were able during dearths to reach even an inch or two above the others will often have been preserved by this process long continued, combined, no doubt, in a most important manner with the inherited effects of increased use of parts. It seems to me almost certain that any ordinary hoofed quadruped or four-legged animal might be converted into a giraffe. Now, there are a number of serious, insurmountable difficulties with such an explanation, but before we get to them, I want to share with you a children's fairy tale from Rudyard Kipling in regards to the elephant's trunk. Once a baby elephant was not staying close to his mama as he was supposed to. Wandering away, he saw the bright, shiny river and stepped closer to investigate. There was a bump sticking out of the water, and wondering what it was, he leaned forward to get a closer look. Suddenly that bump, with all that was attached to it, jumped up and grabbed the nose of that poor little elephant. Then the elephant's child, the baby elephant, sat back on his little haunches and pulled and pulled and pulled, and his nose began to stretch. 
And the crocodile floundered toward the bank, making the water all creamy with great sweeps of his tail. And he pulled and he pulled and he pulled. That's a wonderful story. But it's a fairy tale. And we understand that it is. But Arthur Custance writes, this issue of how the giraffe got its long neck came up one occasion in a pre-med class in the University of Toronto. The lecturer did not lack enthusiasm for his subject, and I'm sure the students were duly impressed with this illustration of how the giraffe got its long neck and the power of natural selection. But I asked the lecturer if there was any difference in height between the males and the females. He paused for a minute as the possible significance of the question seemed to sink in. After a while, he said, I don't know. I shall look into it. Then he explained to the class that if the difference in male and female giraffe neck lengths was substantial, it could put a crimp in the illustration unless the males were uncommonly gentlemanly and stood back to allow the females to survive as well. He never did come back with an answer to my question. If you've ever seen men around food, you know that's not going to happen. But in due course, I found it for myself. The female giraffe is 24 inches shorter than the male. Interestingly, the Reader's Digest publication, The Living World of Animals, extends the potential difference to as much as three feet between the males and the females. Yet Life magazine a while ago presented the giraffe story as a most convincing example of natural selection at work. So there are a number of huge problems with the evolutionist ex explanation of how the giraffe got its long neck. Number one, the problem of the shorter females being able to survive if even an inch or two of extra height conveyed survival benefits, as per Darwin. Surely being two or three feet shorter would have wiped out all the females, which would have wiped out all the giraffes. Number two, there have been zero transitional fossils found that would demonstrate such an evolution of the giraffe's neck. With the amount of time that it would be necessary by the evolutionist's own formulas, there should be ample evidence in the fossil record. Number three, there are no transitional uh, animals alive today of any kind that would illustrate such an evolution. Number four, why did no other animals that existed side by side with the giraffe evolve long necks? If that was indeed necessary for survival. But why do zebras, gazelles, antelopes, and so on have shorter necks? How did they survive? Especially, after all, as, as Darwin said, it seems to me almost certain that any ordinary hoofed quadruped might be converted into a giraffe. Number five, how did the giraffe's complicated, highly detailed blood pressure regulating system evolve? There's little margin for error in areas such as this, and no time to work out any problems and perfect the technique or the system in such a critical area. Loring Brace, in American Scientist Review of Species, Species Concepts, and Primate Evolution said, readers of American scientists may not realize the extent to which a major part of the field of biology and almost all of paleontology has rejected Darwin's insights concerning organic evolution. Natural selection is dismissed as contributing nothing more than fine-tuning, and adaptation is largely ignored in practice. Soren Lovetrop and Darwinism, their refutation of a myth, said, I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. Since there is no evidence, evolutionists have had to come up with a lot of different theories to explain the lack of evidence. Sewell Wright, in Evolution, Volume 36, stated, The reorganization required for the origin of the highest categories may seem so great that only hopeful monsters will do. Here, however, we must consider the size and complexity of the organisms. Such changes would probably have been impossible except in an organism of very small size and simple anatomy. I have recorded more than 100,000 newborn guinea pigs and have seen many hundreds of monsters of diverse sorts, but none were remotely hopeful, all having died shortly after birth, if not earlier. He's referring to the mutations of the guinea pigs that are born. Stephen Jay Gold writes in an article entitled The Return of Hopeful Monsters, published in Natural History, the fossil record with its abrupt transitions offers no support for gradual change. And the principle of natural selection does not require it. Selection can operate rapidly. You remember Darwin said slight successive modification over hundreds of thousands or millions of years. But there's been no evidence to substantiate that. 
He goes on to say, as a Darwinian, and ironically, he's now going to contradict Darwin, but as a Darwinian, I wish to defend Goldschmidt's postulate, and Goldschmidt was the first man that came up with the hopeful monster theory, that macroevolution is not simply microevolution extrapolated or worked out, and that major structural transitions can occur rapidly without a smooth series of intermediate stages. All paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. In other words, we can't find any missing links, so now we'll pretend that we don't really need them. The essence of Darwinism lies in a single phrase. Natural selection is the creative force of evolutionary change. No one denies that natural selection will play a negative role in eliminating the unfit, the monsters, Darwinian theory requires that it create the fit as well, the hopeful monsters. What is the hopeful monster stuff? Well, since there's no evidence for gradual evolution, some evolutionists came up with the idea that perhaps a lizard laid an egg and a bird hatched out, or some other such abrupt leap. Now, obviously, that theory is born out of desperation and is fraught with insurmountable problems. First of all, just taking at face value such a proposal for which there is no evidence whatsoever is very much like a fairy tale. And secondly, nothing even remotely similar has ever been observed. And thirdly, just one hopeful monster won't do you any good. You have to have two. And they have to be the same kind of accidental hopeful monsters. And fourth, one has to be male and one has to be female for obvious reasons. Fifth, they have to hatch around the same time. Six, they have to hatch in fairly close proximity to each other, at least close enough to find each other. Seventh, they have to survive long enough and avoid predators in order to get together. Eighth, they have to be fertile and ready, willing, and able to breed. Ninth, their offspring must survive, including both male and female, and so on. Tenth, their offspring have to be like they are, not revert back to what grandpa was. Uh, other than those and a few other insurmountable problems, it makes a great story. Many other names for the theory and other similar competing theories, but they're all just desperate attempts to avoid the obvious that God created the universe. And Job 20, 12, verse 7 says, But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, Who knoweth not that in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. That last verse ought to get your attention. In whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Later on in Job, we read, If he that is God set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish together and man shall turn again unto dust. God holds your breath in his hand. And when God says that's the last breath you're going to breathe, it doesn't matter what emergency personnel might be around. That's the last breath you're going to breathe. One day you're going to stand before that God. Hebrews 9, 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Romans 14, 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Whether you believe it or not, God is still your creator. You will face him. You cannot get out of those appointments you have, first of all with death, and then secondly with God. You will keep those appointments. You do get to determine one thing, whether you will face God as your judge or as your Savior. You won't decide that then. You must decide it here and now before you die. Don't just accept that God is your creator. Accept him personally as your Savior. Isaiah 45, 22, he says, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. That creator God that knew how to make every animal, every bird, every fish, just exactly right, suited for its environment. They could fling the stars into space and stretch out heaven. He made you. 
don't just acknowledge him as your creator. You've sinned against him. You've broken his laws, his commandments. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the cross of Calvary to shed his blood, to pay the price for your sin, to pay your sin debt, to adopt you into his family, to make you his child. So he says, look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Pray that you'd bless now in this invitation time. Pray that you'd work.